managing crisis can be quite challenging. And many of you will now think, what can we do on the financial side of it? How can I still grow my business? How can I get the most out of it? And we have a professional here today. Hello and welcome, Shas Noas. Thank you very much, Niels. It's an absolute pleasure to be here with you and your audience. Great. Thank you very much for taking the time. So you are dealing with many different businesses at the moment. And uh, of course, many of them are challenged by the situation, some of them more, some of them less. What in your experience is the major mistake business owners do at the moment? I think the big one uh, is that they become uh, rabbits in headlights. By that, I mean they start panicking. So they freeze. They don't do anything. The right now is an opportunity uh, to, for business owners to show how agile they are, uh, how they can think outside the box, how they can do things differently. Uh, and there are lots of opportunities, and I mean that in a nice way, by the way, that mm -hmm. are presenting themselves. So if nothing else, uh, right now, business owners should be thinking about how can they reinvent their business? How can they supply their products, their services, or whatever else they supply in a very different way, be it online or be it having a very different approach in terms of being more customer-centric, customer-focused, uh, and working and developing new ways of delivering those old services and products. Mm. When we talk about new ways of delivering their services, there, there will, of course, be the very, let's, let's put it in the most traditional way. There is a settled business in the area for a very long time. They are networking. They know their clients. They were simply not prepared for a crisis like this because they thought it went on reasonably well or very well even for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. So they might have missed out on the whole idea of selling their services online because they simply didn't have it on the radar. And of course, they thought we don't need it because the business is running well enough. How do you think people can get on board when they join the whole step of the online world quite late? So I think the first thing is in terms of entrepreneurship and being a business owner, taking risks, doing things differently is a constant approach. I'm sure you'll resonate and agree uh, mm -hmm. with this, uh, Niels, that every day is different. So, of course, it's always good, if you can, by the way, to be a pioneer or to lead the way. But generally speaking, we'll see pioneers with uh, arrows in their backs and they're with uh, tire marks on their backs as well because they lead the way, but then... People come from behind uh, who see different opportunities and take over. So, so I don't think people should feel left out or feel like they're left behind. They should now be thinking there's other people out there who are online, for example, to, to, to use the example you've shared, doing things. How can we now create a different niche or different opportunity with the product or service that we have to add extra value? So to put it very simply is to see Where's the gap in the market right now with online and how mm -hmm. can we ful fulfill that gap uh, by doing things differently? And I think that's always going, going to be an opportunity because you'll see time and again uh, that new entrance into any marketplace will come where you think the marketplace is saturated or there's no space for anybody else. A great example, of course, is Amazon. They'll come in, do things differently uh, and take over. And of course, not everybody wants to come in to take over. But if, if people want their share of uh, business, they've got to think deeply and think very hard in terms of how can we offer something which nobody else is offering, which the marketplace wants. Sometimes mm -hmm. people come up with offers, but nobody wants them. <laughs> so then to be very clear on what is their demand for out there mm -hmm. that we can supply. Yeah, especially in the speaking industry, we know that sometimes people have an amazing idea and they say no one on this market ever offered this. Yeah, the reason might be because no one wants it. Absolutely. I mean, just to, to, to touch upon that, uh, I work with a, a, a very large training company uh, turning over eight figures plus. Mm -hmm. uh, all of the events were live uh, and COVID hit uh, and they went online uh, and they turned over a large six-figure sum in the first month by taking all of their courses or taking as many courses as they could online. 
And yet we were told, or people thought, oh, nobody's going to buy these courses online, or then they're not going to pay similar prices uh, mm -hmm. if you go online. But yet the market's been very receptive to that. Now people are thinking, well, hold a minute, do we really want to go back to do live events when we can do everything online, sat at home, delivering the same level of service, and in fact, making it even more intimate? Uh, mm -hmm. Why wouldn't you? Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's, that, that's a great piece of advice. So when I, when I just look on your, on, on, on where you were published, the, the independent, the, the London times, guardian, financial times, BBC radio four. And one of your services is, and you just talked about that briefly. Um, one of your services, is how to increase profit. And I had the same experience. Uh, of course, when COVID hit, I thought, well, let's see if clients are willing to uh, pay the same amount of money they were. And of course, without the travel, the profit margin is higher. One of your consultancy services, how to increase profit. Do you think that, in, because I'm a consultancy business training and speaking business, but would you say that at the moment, is there really every business where you can say there is still something in there where you can increase profit? Would you say that applies to every business? I, from my own experience, uh, Niels, and uh, I wrote a short book uh, called The Authority Guide to Pricing. And of course, from everything I've done over now, well over 3,000 business growth consultations, by far the quickest way to increase profits, of course, is to increase your prices. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and the reason why businesses don't do it, by the way, is or business owners don't do it, is in their own mind, they have certain blockages and hurdles and objections, which they can't get over themselves mentally. Therefore, that stops them increasing prices. And the biggest one, by the way, is, well, I wouldn't pay the extra. So why would somebody else? What they forget is they are not their customer. Uh, yeah. So to answer your question, uh, to say every single business may be a bit too broad because somebody will be listening to this and saying, oh, well, it doesn't apply to my business. Uh, mm. But I'm, I'm yet to find a business where we've increased the prices and as a direct result, the business has been worse off. So yes, they might lose, let's say 2% of their customers as an example, but the mm. bottom line goes up by say 13%. So now they've mm. got less customers, more profit, more time, and everybody's happier. So why wouldn't yeah. you? So let's, let's take a typical approach. You have a mid-sized business. There's an owner. The owner has a couple of salespeople on staff. Salespeople normally drive to the customers. They can't. And now suddenly this owner says, I want to increase prices. And now, of course, the sales team will say, are you out of your mind? Because we are already struggling enough. And now you're raising the prices. How would you deal with commuting, not, not only convincing the owner, and, but also their sales team, and how to communicate that when you have to justify your price, not only for yourself and your customers, but also for your internal team and, and the people who work for you. Yeah, absolutely. So I think the first sale has to be made by the business owner to themselves. So mm -hmm. obviously there's, there's different ways people learn uh, or, and take in information in different ways. Some are more logical, some are emotional, some you've got to create a, a spreadsheet and explain the benefits, but with adding uh, or increasing the prices, it, I mean, more often than not, we've done it where it's just been a straight increase, but you can add more value in terms of saying, what are, is the gap in our offering right now, which people really need, which we've got time to supply, by the way, because there's not that much more going on. So we've got all this workforce sat here who can supply that. And in, in order to do that, we can justify a price increase. But again, price is more of a conversation to demonstrate value to your customers. In terms of obviously uh, trying to persuade uh, the sales staff, what I usually do, Niels, is rather than saying blanket, okay, we're going to increase the price for everybody, I'll say, let's test it, give it to every salesperson, mm. let's give them the new added value or the different way of presenting price uh, and say, Test it with two or three of, of your existing customers or your new prospects or leads. Once you've tested, come back, tell us what worked, what didn't work, what objections did you get? And by the way, we'll address those objections in advance anyway. So, so the kind of general objections people may have to price, we'll, we'll make sure we give those to the sales staff. And lo and behold, when they come back, they say, well, that was easier than I thought. Mm -hmm. And that's because... 
they were able to demonstrate the value and they were able to connect. You know, people buy from people and people buy uh, from people who are enthusiastic. So if, if, you're, if you have a salesperson who's going to present in a very sloppy way, isn't convinced that they have the best product or the best service, they're adding value, the customer is genuinely going to get the best result by working with them, then they can have the lowest price in the market, by the way. People aren't going to buy. But if, exactly. if you're generally enthusiastic, you believe in the product, you know it's going to change the lives of people you're selling to, or they're going to get a huge benefit, then people buy that enthusiasm. It's contagious. Mm. So uh, you said that you wrote a book about pricing. Can you give us a bit more details on that? Absolutely. So uh, having worked with business owners uh, for quite a few years, at that time, best part of 13 years, what I found was that the biggest area that I had the biggest impact for people was helping them to obviously increase their profits, but by increasing their, their pricing. Uh, so I was approached by somebody who you know as well, who, who writes these authority guides to mm -hmm. write a book on pricing. And in that book, uh, I've shared quite a, diff, quite a few different techniques, methods, ways uh, for people to increase their prices, to, no, to not only have the confidence to do it, but to give them a step-by-step -step guide in terms of how they can do it, because obviously everybody's different and different techniques work for different people. Excellent. So when people are now sitting there and think, hmm, maybe I should do something, but of course the main question is where to start. To round and wrap the whole interview up, what, what are your top three tips to start right now? So the first thing is to think about every single thing you can do differently and then write down what are the upsides of, mm -hmm. the, of, of, of doing each thing, what are the downsides of doing each thing, or each thing, what are the risks with the downside? If things go wrong with the downside, are you going to be able to live with that? If you can't, obviously don't do it. Then look at the upside, whatever the upside is, I always say divide it by two. So if the upside is you're going to increase your, your margins by 10%, for example, divide it by two and, and call it uh, 5%. So go in with your eyes open. Once you've done that exercise, to two or three things are going to be very apparent to you from your list of things to do. Then start thinking about how you can implement them. The second thing I would say is take some action. So don't freeze there. Don't watch the marketplace. Don't mm -hmm. look at what other people are doing. The herd mentality, okay, <laughs> is the worst thing people can do, in my opinion, is mm -hmm. observe the masses, see what they're doing, and go in the opposite direction. And the third thing, which might seem like a contradiction to the first two, is don't jump on the first opportunity that you think you see, you hear about on social media or, on, or, on, or any other form of media or any influences uh, that you see, hear or listen to. Look very carefully at where the real big opportunity in your business is to, re in order to reinvent. And if you can f uh, find that opportunity to reinvent your business, and this exists in every single business, by the way, Niels, if you can find that opportunity, again, go through the exercise of the upside, the, 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 the downside and all the risks, and then explore that further and get onto it uh, ASAP. Excellent. Those are the three things I would say people should be focusing on. Perfect. I think these are the perfect final words for this podcast. Of course, Shaz, I'm going to put your contact data in the show notes of this podcast so people can get in touch with you directly when they have any additional aspects they like to talk about, or of course, when they want to book you as a consultant or your services in accountancy. And uh, for this uh, interview, just to wrap everything up, there's only one thing left for me to say, Shaz, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Niels. It's been an absolute pleasure and I hope your followers get great value from this.